This afternoon, we had a wonderful time studying God's Word together. And um, we got into quite a good discussion about uh, the physical appearing of Lucifer masquerading as Almighty God. And I believe Brenton brought up the idea that uh, rather than the lamb-like beast or the beast of Revelation 13 coming as a caricature of Jesus, that he could come representing a higher God, the most high God. Was that, that you, Brenton, that brought that idea? Okay. You got in on the discussion. Uh, I don't know then how the idea came up. I don't know whether I said it or someone else said it, but who said it? Well, we'll we've got the evidence. We'll find out. <laughs> What we were discussing was if he came at representing Jesus, you know, masquerading as Jesus, then he alienates 71% of the world because they're opposed to Jesus. And so the idea came forth that what if Lucifer came masquerading as the most high God? And we looked in Isaiah 14 where the scripture says that his plan and his jealousy and his goal was to set himself up uh, above uh, and, and sit on the sides of the north where the most high God would sit. And I brought out the point that Lucifer's real gripe in heaven was with the Father. Now, he was jealous of Jesus, but his ultimate expulsion came when the father put the eternal gospel test to him and he wouldn't bow down and worship and it was the father who threw him out. And so I got to thinking about that after the meeting. You know, engineers are never satisfied and, and, and you, you keep needling and picking and working away at things to get them just as such in as good a possible condition Condition as you can. And so I got to thinking, the term Most High God was used in the time of Nebuchadnezzar when he called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of the furnace. Servants of the Most High God, come out! Now, think about it for a minute. If, if, if Jesus, uh, excuse me, if Lucifer came at the fifth trumpet masquerading as the Most High God, he would have Christians in his pocket because they believe three in one. <laughs> in other words, they think the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is all the same God. And so he can just tell them, you know, if you want to call me Jesus, that's all right. But I really am the Father. We're three in one. Because most Christians do not understand three gods. And so for those few Christians that understand three gods, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he can say to them, I left Jesus in heaven. <laughs> now, masquerading as most high God, he could appear to the Hindus and Buddhists, and this was a term that would not be offensive and would not be antagonistic to their beliefs during that first five months. And so... He can be supreme God of all gods with very little trouble if he comes representing Most High God. Does that make sense? And so, I, you know, I looked, at, uh, the, 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 looked up the phrase Most High God and Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, it is, it is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed uh, for me. I'm sorry, this is Nebuchadnezzar talking. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. Um, look at another phrase. When Daniel comes to Belshazzar, O king, this is the night the handwriting is on the wall. The Most High God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar. It's interesting, he doesn't, Daniel doesn't call him Jehovah. 
you know. He doesn't use the Jewish name for God. He calls him Most High God because the Babylonians had many gods. So here was a way uh, of usurping, you know, uh, the, the baggage that came with the Jewish God being supreme over the Babylonian God and, and just simply Most High God takes care of everything. So if Lucifer comes masquerading as most high God, I see an easy fit for everything I know about the subject thus far. So your contributions and your your drilling me on that this afternoon, it was helpful. You know, we're all after the truth. Whatever, my prayer is, Lord, I don't care what it is. I just want to know it. So, I, I just thought that was a beautiful, yes, huh? Oh, well, thank you for coming. Okay. I want to return your attention for a few moments to uh, some verses we read the other night. When you recall that we were talking about the... Um, nature of the physical signs that appear at the second coming. Re- do you remember that discussion? I know, I know you have slept since then, but do you remember <laughs> the conversation? And I was trying to show you that these are very literal, very real. This is not symbolic. This is not analogous. This is real language describing real things and these flashes of lightning rumblings peals of thunder earthquake like no like has never occurred since man has been on earth so tremendous was the quake there was a big that's right there was a big storm going on that night and we were concerned about the great wind that was about to take us away (laughs) <laughs> so, the reality of Revelation 16.8, remember, this is something that takes place at the seventh bowl. Seventh bowl. This is at the second coming. The seventh bowl is the last judgment. And this is where Armageddon is fought. And this is where all the wicked are killed. So, the, the context here in Revelation 16.18 the thing that I want you to see is that the language has nothing is not symbolic in the least. That's the point I want you to see. And then I showed you at the seventh trumpet. I backed up 70 days and showed you the seventh trumpet. Same symbols, and the language was all literal. And then I backed up 1,200, uh, 1260 days to the casting down of the censer, showing you again that the language was not symbolic. It was all very literal. Okay, now that I've got that thought going, I want to move from verse 18 to verse 19 in Revelation 16. Notice what the Bible says. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Now, this is where things get kind of messy. Verse 20. Every island fled away, and the mountains could not be found. So verse 20 is not at all symbolic. It is not at all analogous or a metaphor. The language says what it means just as it reads. Every island. We're not talking about symbolic islands and symbolic mountains disappearing. Okay, everyone's with me? But let's go back to verse 19, and I want to show you that symbolic language, 
analogous language and literal language can be all in the same verse. <laughs> and this is what makes it so hard to finally get your mind around until all the pieces come together. And that's why Rule 3 exists. I, I haven't talked much about Rule 3 in seminars because people, we just haven't gotten into it. But I thought tonight would be a perfectly good time to talk about Rule 3 and show you how cool it is. Rule 3 in the interpretive process goes like this. Apocalyptic prophecy has three kinds of language. Sometimes it's literal, sometimes it's symbolic, and sometimes it's analogous. Analogous language is language that's used as a description or a parallel or a metaphor. For example, um, when we say, let me give you an example here real quick. In Revelation chapter 9, Verse 3, verse 2, when the angel opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. You see that word like? That means we're about to use a metaphor. That means we're about to use a comparison. That means we're going to use a description of something that's known to describe something that is unknown. He flew by me faster than the speed of sound. You get the metaphor? So when we're talking about analogous language, when he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it, like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. Well, now let me be clear. Smoke did not actually come out of the abyss. We're using a metaphor. Something like smoke comes out of the abyss. And the sun and sky were darkened by the something that's like smoke. Main, mainly, a million angels in the sky are so many and so big, and they obscure the sun. And the sky is clouded over by their physical presence. Am I making any sense? And out of the smoke, these beings, at, from a distance, which look like locusts, we're again using a metaphor that came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpion. Like metaphor, that of scorpions. What would a, what would a flock of angels from a great distance look like if not locusts? Put on John's sandals for a minute. John has never seen an airplane. And, and from a distance, from a distance, a, a million angels would look like a swarm of locusts. Have you ever seen swarms? I've seen, I've not personally, but I have seen them in, in this, on the Discovery Channel. And, and they, 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 when they fly up, they are so thick that they are black. It's a black cloud. And so Revelation uses three kinds of language. Rule three, apocalyptic prophecy has literal, symbolic, and analogous language. To reach, I'm continuing with the rule, to reach the intended meaning, we have to consider the context in which it's the, the language is written. We have to consider the context. If a phrase 
is thought to be symbolic, we must then find a relevant Bible text that interprets the symbol for everybody in the whole wide world. Nobody is free to make up the meaning of symbols because if you are free to make up the meaning of a symbol, so is he. Everybody then gets the same privilege. And so if you want to make it symbolic and you cannot find, and this is key, you've got to find a relevant, a relevant scripture, a relevant verse to interpret the symbol so that the Bible can tell everybody on earth the meaning of the symbol. Let me give you an example. Revelation 17, John sees a great prostitute who sits on many waters. Okay? A great prostitute who sits on many waters. Well, when we go down to the end of the chapter, we find, we find out who this woman is. Notice the woman you saw is what? The great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Hmm. So the prostitute, the woman, is a symbol. And we have a relevant Bible text to interpret the symbol. What makes this verse 18 relevant? It's relevant because the symbol is identified and the meaning is declared. And when you apply it, it makes perfect sense. One other thing. Um, The waters you saw, where the prostitute sits, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. So we have, again, a relevant Bible text defining the waters, the prostitute sits upon the waters. And so a relevant Bible text comes back around where the symbol is identified And the meaning is declared. That is what relevant means. So far, so good. So if it's literal, there's no symbolic meaning. The islands and the mountains are moved out of their places. Literal language. The prostitute sitting on many waters, symbolic language. The smoke coming out. The the great herd coming out of the abyss that darkens the sky like the smoke of a great furnace. Analogous language. Am I making sense tonight? I know this is not freshman comp, but I'm trying to help you understand some of the way that God wrote the book of Revelation. And rule three, let me say it again, goes like this. It says, apocalyptic prophecy has three kinds of language. Literal, symbolic, and analogous. To reach the intended meaning, we first have to consider the context. If the language is thought to be symbolic, then we have to find a relevant text to define the symbol. We are not free to make up the symbol. If we think the language is analogous, then we can search the scriptures to understand the context, or we can sometimes use parallel language from other places in the Bible to understand how they how it, what it meant here, so that what it means here is the same thing, using parallel language. 
So tonight, I want you to, to see that in the middle, right here, in the seventh bowl, this language is all literal. This earthquake, rumblings, peals of thunder, blah, blah, blah. It's all literal. And then we come to verse 19. Now, who is the great city? I just read that. In Revelation 17, verse 18, she's the prostitute that sits upon many waters. But watch this. In this one sentence, the great city split into three parts. That's symbolic. And the cities of the nations collapsed. That's literal. In one sentence. And if you're just flying through Revelation, trying to make everything symbolic, it it will make no sense. If you're flying through Revelation trying to make everything literal, that too won't make any sense. So you've got to watch what God has done very closely and watch the language. You have to put several things in mind. You've got to have some variables up here stored away so that when you're reading along and you see, ah, the great city. I know what that is. That's the woman. That's the prostitute. That's the theocracy that Lucifer sets up. And at the seventh bowl, the great prostitute is going to be destroyed three-thirds. That's the point. The city is split into three parts for utter destruction. No one-third, two-thirds. It is three-thirds gone. And, and... Because of the great earthquake and every island and mountain could not be found and every island fled away, the cities of the nations collapsed. Am I making sense? God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. What does that phrase mean? What is the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath? What what does that mean? language tell us. Do you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was just sweating blood going to the cross. And as he's lying there prostrate over a rock, praying to the Father, he said, Father, if possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, thy will, not my will, be done. What did Jesus mean? If possible, let this cup pass from me. Well, the ancients had a way of expressing themselves that if you had done evil, then you had to drink in the consequences of your wrongdoing. And the idea of drinking in the consequences of your wrongdoing means that your evil must come back and consume you. As you gave to others in evil, you must drink in the same evil. And so the cup... Remember in the 23rd Psalm, my cup runneth over. My life's experience in the Lord, David said, is full and overflowing with joy. But the cup can also contain the bitter drag, the bitter dregs of the, of the grape and, and the, bitter, the bitter wine. And so swallowing that. And when Jesus was on the cross... What did they give him to drink? Vinegar. Vinegar. That was the drink for criminals. You drink in your own misery that you've created. So the idea is that God is going to give Babylon and all who are associated with this corrupt government, he's going to give them all a good dose of their own medicine mixed with castor oil. What tastes worse than castor oil? 
I can't think of anything. Maybe gasoline. You ever tried to siphon gasoline and get a mouthful? Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. Okay. So this little lesson, this little nugget, I want you to see the, how rule three works. And when you're reading Revelation and you're carefully watching what you're reading, you're looking at the three possibilities for language. Keep, keep that in mind. Because this, this has to do with the, su the subject we're going to talk about just now. Letty mentioned this morning about the 144,000 who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. Now, I'd like to do a little exegetical work on this with you for a moment and just sort of drive you nuts in the process, if I can. <laughs> is this literal language? Is this analogous language? Or is this symbolic language? Don't answer. <laughs> I want you to think about it for a minute. These are those who did not defile, speaking of the 144,000, these are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They become a personal entourage of Christ. Wherever the President goes, the Secret Service go with Him. Well, guess what? When Jesus goes somewhere, 144,000 people go with him. <laughs> How about having him for lunch some day? <laughs> Wherever the lamb goes, they go. My, what a troop. What a, that's a big bus, you know it? They carry all the Lord's attendees around with him. They follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. All right, you know all this. Then it says, no lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. So my question is, what is the big deal here? Not defiled with women and they are not liars. Is that a big deal or not? Isn't it true? That no sexually immoral person and no liar will enter heaven anyway? <laughs> so what's, why, why is this being said if we know that no sexually immoral and no liar is going to enter heaven? Why is this being reiterated in Revelation 14 concerning the 144,000? Is that a reasonable question? The 144,000 in Revelation 14 are being exalted to the highest. They are there first. They are the first fruits. And why is it said of them, they did not defile themselves with women, and they, no lie was found in their mouths? Let me just make it clear that in Revelation 22:15, the Bible says, outside the holy city, are the dogs. That is, unclean people. Those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone and who loves and practices falsehood. So, what is the big deal with the 144,000 if this is true of everyone else? I'm trying to agitate you just a little bit. <laughs> okay? Not defiled with women. They are not liars. I would like to have you consider this. I believe the scriptures in exalting the 144,000 and says that they are not liars is saying a lot more than meets the naked eye. I believe it means the 144,000 will deliver the testimony of Jesus 
without any regard for personal safety or suffering. When you realize the beating that will come from doing this, saying that they faithfully spoke the words given them without regard for personal safety, that puts them in a category above those who did not tell a lie on their own. These are people with a message from God and as unpleasant and as rebuking and as harsh as it may sound to the carnal nature. They deliver it faithfully without watering it down or without trying to escape the consequences. Does that make sense? Do you understand the overwhelming temptation that could arise in this situation if the 144,000 were not sealed? Because the 144,000 will be free of the sinful nature, there will be no desire within them to distort or soften the truth. They know that they will live for as long as Jesus gives them life. And they know their death is coming. The scriptures are quite clear. If you're selected and called to be one of the 144,000, you know very well it's a call to death. It's a call to carry a very heavy cross for 1,260 days that ultimately ends with your death. It's like holding a seminar every day for 1,260 <laughs> days. All right, all right. No, it's worse than that. It's worse than that. The 144,000 will serve Jesus just as Jesus served the Father. John 17, 8. Jesus prayed to the Father, for I gave them the words you gave me. Stop right there for a moment. Do you realize that when Jesus was on earth, when his lips were moving, the words coming out were not his own. When his lips were moving, the words coming out were coming from the Father. The Father was speaking through the lips of Jesus. I gave them the words you gave me. And they accepted them, speaking of his disciples. And they knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. In John 14, 24, Jesus said to the, uh, to the Jews, These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Have you thought of Jesus really as a mouthpiece for the Father? Or have you just sort of thought of the ministry of Christ as Jesus coming to, to do battle with the Pharisees? How, how, do, how do you see the ministry of Jesus? Think about it. The Father sent Jesus to do battle himself with the Pharisees. And Jesus is the mouthpiece. The words you hear are not my own. And then in John 14, 10, he says it again. The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. So the phrase, no lie was found in their mouths, is huge. It means the 144,000 faithfully spoke the words given to them, and they did not hold back a scintilla. You know what a scintilla is? It's that little accent that's used on certain words to change the tone of the word. It's just a little tiny dot. Jesus spoke the words and did not hold back even a scintilla. 
In Luke 12, 11, when you are brought before synagogues, rulers and authorities, Jesus said to his disciples, don't worry how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you without preparation at that time what you should say. Now, now, we're going to examine the phrase, not defiled by women. There's lots of speculation on this. Are the 144,000 unmarried male virgins? Are the 144,000 servants, both men and women, who are sexually pure? We know, as Letty said, and Romans 1 says, Women can defile themselves with women in Romans 1.26. So what does they did not defile themselves with women mean? Do you take this as analogous, symbolic, or literal? In a sentence, I believe this phrase indicates a fidelity to mission that mirrors the life of Christ. Consider this, marriage is not defiling. God created marriage. Getting married is not defiling in any way. It is a holy state and often called the holy state of matrimony. So marriage is not defiling. God married Adam and Eve. God created marriage and the marriage Bed should be kept pure. Marriage should be honored by all, Paul says, for God will condemn the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. The word judge there means to condemn. So marriage in itself is not defiling. However, if Jesus had married, he would have defiled the mission given to him by the Father. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus denied himself any relationship that would or could distract from his mission. In Matthew 16, 20, one day, he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. And from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke Jesus. Never, never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus spoke Plainly, he turned and said to Peter, who was one of his closest friends, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Whew. You ever had a friend speak to you like that? That'd be kind of a punch in the stomach, wouldn't it? Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And if anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Whew. The Father gave Jesus a huge cross to carry. If Jesus had sought the love, fellowship, and companionship that comes with marriage, he would have defiled the mission given to him by the Father. Therefore, knowing the 144,000 will be selected and sealed prior to the, great, to the commencement of the Great Tribulation, 
knowing that the 144,000 will have sinless natures just before the great tribulation begins, knowing something of the purpose and suicide mission given to the 144,000, knowing the suffering, persecution, and death the 144,000 will experience, knowing that they are purchased from among men and presented as first fruits, and knowing the 144,000 will be human mirrors of the ministry and work of Jesus, I conclude the phrase, not defiled by women, and no lie was found in their mouths to mean the highest possible exaltation that can be said of the 144,000. The 144,000 will not allow any human relationship, marriage or familial, to distract them or to defile their mission. When Jesus calls and selects them for his service, he will set them apart from all human beings with a sinless nature. And how well would that work out in a marriage? badly. How can you be married to someone who's perfect if you aren't? How long is that going to (laughs) last? We will not get into any personal details. (laughs) In fact, this is a good place to cool off and take a 15-minute break. Let's do that just now.